Western Hills High School's gymnasium was transformed that Saturday night. Crepe paper streamers hung from the ceiling, and the local band played cover songs that echoed through the halls. 17-year-old Carla Walker stood in front of her bedroom mirror, adjusting her new dress, a flowing blue number that her mother had helped her pick out. You look beautiful, sweetheart, Sharon Walker said, watching her daughter from the doorway. Carla's blue eyes sparkled as she turned to her mother. Thanks, Mom. Rodney should be here any minute. Rodney Ricky, Carla's boyfriend, was exactly the kind of boy parents hoped their daughter would date. A high school senior, football player, and honor roll student, he had been dating Carla for over a year. They were talking about college together, making plans for the future. The dance was everything a high school event should be. Carla and Rodney danced, laughed with friends, and shared punch by the refreshment table. Photos from that night would later haunt the community. Carla's bright smile, her blue dress, Rodney's proud stance beside her. Around 11.30 p.m., they left the dance. They had plans to grab a late-night burger at the Sonic Drive-In, a regular hangout for Western Hills students. The night was cool but clear, typical for a Texas February. They pulled into the parking lot of the Brunswick Bowling Alley, just around the corner from Carla's house. It was a common spot for local teens to park and talk. Rodney shut off the car engine but left the radio playing softly. Neither of them noticed the figure approaching in the darkness. The passenger door was suddenly yanked open. Before either teen could react, a man thrust a gun into the car, pointing it at Rodney's head. Don't move, the man growled. Rodney, instinctively trying to protect Carla, reached for the gun. The struggle was brief and violent. The attacker pistol-whipped Rodney repeatedly, leaving him unconscious and bleeding in the driver's seat. The last thing Rodney heard before losing consciousness was Carla's scream as she was dragged from the car. Rodney woke up in the hospital with a severe concussion and no memory of how he got there. A passerby had found him slumped over the steering wheel, blood covering the dashboard. When he managed to speak, his first word was Carla. Detective Jim Meredith of the Fort Worth Police Department stood in the bowling alley parking lot early Sunday morning, studying the scene. Blood stained the car's interior. Signs of a struggle were evident, but there was something else. Three small threads from what appeared to be a blue dress caught in the doorframe. What do we know? He asked the first officers on scene. Victim is Carla Jan Walker, 17 years old, abducted from this location approximately midnight. Boyfriend was assaulted but survived. No witnesses so far. Meredith looked at the photo of Carla provided by her parents a pretty teenager with long brown hair and a bright smile. In his 20 years on the force, he'd worked dozens of missing persons cases. But something about this one felt different. By Sunday afternoon, hundreds of volunteers had gathered at Western Hills High School. Teachers, students, parents, they formed search parties to comb every inch of Western Fort Worth. Carla's father, Jim Walker, stood before the crowd, his voice breaking. Please help us find our little girl, just Please bring her home. The search extended through Sunday and into Monday. Helicopters scanned open areas. Dogs traced scents. Police checked every abandoned building and empty lot in a 10-mile radius. But Carla Walker had vanished. For three days, Fort Worth held its breath. Every phone call to the police station could be the one. Every unconfirmed sighting sparked new searches. Carla's photo was everywhere on telephone poles, in shop windows, on the front page of the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. Rodney Ricky, still recovering from his injuries, told his story again and again to detectives. I should have protected her, he repeated, his voice hollow. I should have done more. On February 20, 1974, three days after Carla's disappearance, a worker at a culvert near Benbrook Lake made the discovery. He called the police immediately, his hands shaking as he dialed. Detective Meredith arrived to find what he had feared most. Carla Walker's body had been hidden in the culvert. She was still wearing the blue dress from the dance. The medical examiner's findings were devastating. Carla had been tortured and sexually assaulted. She had been alive for several days before being killed. The cause of death was strangulation. The news hit Fort Worth like a physical blow. Parents kept their children closer. Teenage couples stopped parking at night. 
The bowling alley where Carla was taken saw its business drop to almost nothing. At Western Hills High School, Carla's empty desk became a memorial. Students left flowers, notes, and photos. The school yearbook that year would include a full page dedicated to her memory. Detective Meredith and his team worked around the clock. They collected evidence from the crime scene, fibers, hair samples, and most importantly, DNA evidence that would prove crucial decades later. But in 1974, DNA testing didn't exist. They had to rely on traditional police work. Interviews with suspects. The investigation focused first on known sex offenders in the area. Each was questioned, their alibis checked, none led anywhere. They looked at everyone who worked at the bowling alley, the school, the surrounding businesses. They interviewed Carla's classmates, teachers, family, friends. One name came up during the investigation, Glenn Samuel McCurley, a 29-year-old man living nearby. He owned the same type of gun believed to be used in the attack on Rodney. But without solid evidence, they couldn't make a case. By summer 1974, the investigation had stalled. Detective Meredith kept the case file on his desk, reviewing it regularly, looking for anything they might have missed. We're missing something, he told his partner. The answer is here somewhere. The Walker family's pain. Jim and Sharon Walker tried to keep living. They had other children who needed them. But the loss of Carla left a hole that nothing could fill. Every time the phone rings, Sharon later said, Every time someone knocks at the door, for just a second, I think it might be news about Carla's killer. Rodney Ricky graduated that spring, but didn't go to the ceremony. The guilt of surviving when Carla didn't haunted him. He would later tell reporters that he visited her grave every week for years. I promised to protect her, he said. I failed. As months turned into years, the case gradually moved to the cold case files. Detective Meredith retired in 1985, still troubled by the unsolved murder. Some cases stay with you, he said in a 1990 interview. Carla Walker's is one of those cases. That girl deserved justice. New detectives would periodically review the file. Each time technology advanced, they would try new techniques. But year after year, decade after decade, Carla's killer remained free. Fort Worth grew and changed through the 1980s but Carla's murder left a lasting mark. Parents warned their teenagers about the bowling alley killer. The story became local legend, passed down to each new generation of high school students. The Walker family moved away from their old neighborhood, unable to bear living so close to where Carla was taken. But they never left Fort Worth, hoping to be there when the killer was finally caught. In 1994, 20 years after Carla's death, DNA testing had become a powerful tool in solving crimes. Fort Worth police created a cold case unit, and Carla's case was one of the first they reviewed. The evidence from 1974 had been carefully preserved. Clothing fibers, hair samples, and most crucially, DNA evidence from the assault. But the technology wasn't quite advanced enough yet to provide the answers they needed. Jim Meredith, now retired, would still call the department regularly to check on the case. Don't let her be forgotten, he would say. Cindy Stone, Carla's sister, made it her mission to keep the case alive. She gave interviews, created websites, and pressured the police department to keep investigating. Carla was more than just a victim. Cindy told reporters in 2004 on the 30th anniversary of the murder. She was a daughter, a sister, a girlfriend. She had dreams. She wanted to be a teacher. Someone took all that away from her, and they need to answer for it. Detective Jeff Bennett inherited the case in 2010. Like many Fort Worth officers, he'd grown up hearing about Carla Walker. Now, it was his responsibility to find her killer. Cold cases are puzzles, Bennett said. All the pieces are there. We just need to find new ways to put them together. By 2019, DNA testing had advanced significantly. The cold case unit submitted the preserved evidence for new analysis using genetic genealogy the same technique that had recently solved the Golden State Killer case. Scientists were able to create a complete DNA profile of Carla's killer. Now they just needed to find a match. April 2020. Detective Bennett received the call he'd been waiting for. The DNA profile had found a match in a criminal database. The same man who had been questioned in 1974, the same man who had owned the type of gun used to attack Rodney, 
He had been living in Fort Worth the entire time, less than four miles from where Carla's body was found. Detectives began surveillance on McCurley, now 77 years old. They collected his discarded DNA samples to confirm the match. They re-interviewed witnesses from 1974, building a timeline of his movements. We had to be absolutely certain, Bennett said. This family has waited 46 years for answers. We couldn't risk making a mistake. The DNA was conclusive. Modern testing showed that the chances of the DNA belonging to someone other than McCurley were 1 in 12 septillion. Early morning sunlight was just beginning to spread across Fort Worth when police vehicles surrounded Glenn McCurley's modest home. Neighbors watched as the elderly man was led out in handcuffs, looking confused and frail. Glenn Samuel McCurley, Detective Bennett read from the warrant, you are under arrest for the capital murder of Carla Jan Walker. In the interrogation room, McCurley initially denied everything. He claimed he couldn't remember where he was in February 1974. But as detectives presented the DNA evidence, his denials began to crack. Finally, after hours of questioning, McCurley started talking. His version of events was chilling in its casualness. He had been drinking that night, driving around with his gun. He saw the young couple at the bowling alley and acted on impulse. I just wanted to scare them, he said but things went wrong. After knocking out Rodney, he forced Carla into his car. The details of what happened next were too horrific for many newspapers to print. McCurley held Carla captive for three days in a location he refused to reveal. Finally, when he feared she might be recognized, he killed her and left her body in the culvert. Detective Bennett's next task was the one he'd both dreaded and longed for, telling the Walker family they had finally caught Carla's killer. Jim Walker, now in his 80s, broke down when he heard the news. I never thought I'd live to see this day, he said. Sharon Walker had passed away in 2019, never knowing who killed her daughter. At least she's with Carla now, Jim said. When reporters reached out to Rodney Rickey, now living in another state, his response was brief, thank God. He had carried the guilt of that night for 46 years. News of McCurley's arrest spread quickly through Fort Worth. Many residents who remembered 1974 called the police station to express their gratitude. Some broke down crying when they heard the news. Western Hills High School, where Carla had been a student, held a memorial service. Current students, none of whom had been born when Carla died, placed flowers at the memorial plaque bearing her name. As prosecutors prepared for trial, the full scope of the investigation became clear. The preservation of evidence in 1974 had been crucial. Detective Meredith's careful work decades ago had made the modern DNA testing possible. The gun used to attack Rodney was found in McCurley's home. He had kept it all these years. Ballistics matched it to the assault. Investigators also found old photographs in McCurley's house, showing he had stalked other young women in the 1970s, though no other murders could be definitively linked to him. The Tarrant County Courthouse was packed as Glenn McCurley's trial began. Now 78 years old, he shuffled into court using a walker, looking nothing like the strong young man who had overpowered two teenagers in 1974. Cindy Stone, Carla's sister, sat in the front row every day, often clutching a photo of Carla. Jim Walker, despite his age and failing health, attended whenever he could. The most powerful moment came when Rodney Rickey took the stand. Now in his mid-sixties, he recounted that night for the first time in decades. His voice broke as he described his last moments with Carla. I heard her scream, he testified. That scream has haunted me for 46 years. McCurley's court-appointed attorneys had little to work with. They couldn't challenge the DNA evidence. Instead, they focused on McCurley's age and declining health, arguing he was too old for prison. After just two hours of deliberation, the jury returned their verdict guilty of capital murder. The sentence was automatic, life in prison without possibility of parole. Texas no longer sought the death penalty in cases where the defendant was over 70. The conviction brought closure to many, but also raised questions about other unsolved crimes from the 1970s. Could McCurley have been responsible for other attacks? The investigation continues. The Carla Walker case has become a textbook example of the importance of evidence preservation and the power of advancing technology. 
Fort Worth police now use it in training new detectives about cold case investigations. The department created the Carla Walker Protocol for preserving evidence in current cases, ensuring that future investigators will have the same opportunities that helped solve Carla's murder. In October 2021, the Walker family held a memorial service at Carla's grave. For the first time, they could visit knowing her killer was behind bars. It's different now, Cindy Stone said. We can remember Carla without always wondering who killed her. Jim Walker spoke briefly at the service. Sharon would have wanted to be here, he said, referring to his late wife. But I believe she knows. I believe she and Carla both know justice was finally done. The case has become an inspiration for other cold case investigations across the country. Detective Bennett frequently speaks at law enforcement conferences about the importance of never giving up on old cases. Technology keeps advancing, he tells audiences. What's unsolvable today might be solvable tomorrow. We owe it to the victims and their families to keep trying. Carla Walker's story is more than just a solved cold case. It's a testament to the dedication of law enforcement officers who never gave up, the love of a family who never stopped searching for answers, and the advances in science that finally brought a killer to justice. In the end, it took 46 years, countless hours of investigation, and revolutionary advances in DNA technology to solve the crime. But as Jim Walker said after the verdict, Carla finally got her day in court. That's all we ever wanted. Today, Carla's memorial at Western Hills High School includes a new inscription. Justice delayed, but not denied. This case serves as a reminder that no matter how much time passes, the truth can eventually come to light. It offers hope to families still waiting for answers about their own loved ones and stands as a warning to criminals that advances in technology mean no case is ever truly cold.